I want to ask you, who is in your life, who has poured into you as a spiritual mentor? And maybe nobody has. But have you had anybody that has mentored you? The other night, uh, Monday night, Donna spoke to a bunch of women over. Hey, Phil Mischke, how you doing, buddy? I wouldn't embarrass you for the world. The only, <laughs> the only reason I do that, he and I played football together all the way through high school. He was the right guard. I was the right tackle. All right. But uh, we went to Jonesboro, and uh, we, Donna was speaking to a bunch of ladies over there. And when the pastor, Archie Mason, Mason found out I was coming, he said, uh, hey, man, he said, would you come speak to our staff? I said, sure. And so I went and talked to, uh, staff members are getting young looking. You know, they, they look so young. They're letting babies on staff nowadays. But anyway, uh, they're also letting babies play baseball and football and stuff. But anyway, um, I talked with them. And one of the things I told them was that they needed to get paired up with somebody more spiritually mature than them. And I told them about one of my mentors. You've never heard of him, Denzel Dukes. Uh, I think that I just always thought he had the coolest name, Denzel. I just thought that was a cool name. And then with Dukes, I mean, that just sounds manly, does it not? And so uh, I, I go, I'm like 19, 20 years old. I go to First Baptist Milan. I'd never been on a church staff and uh, go there. And Denzel Dukes never got, you know, he, he was not a famous preacher or anything like that. He never got invited to do revivals, or anything like that. Just a solid guy that pastored a church in West Tennessee, First Baptist Milan, and he loved the Lord. And he, the first day I was there, he said, I want you to go ho- to visit with me in hospitals. I said, okay. And so I went, I'll never forget, I had on tennis shoes. He said, you're going to wear those? I said, it's all I got. He said, let's go. And so we went and he mentored me. He would call me up and say, hey, I'm doing a funeral uh, this afternoon. Why don't you go with me? Just watch what I do. And then after it's over, we'll go get a Coke, and uh, we'll talk about it, and you can ask me anything you want. Then he'd call me up and say, hey, I'm doing a wedding this Saturday. Why don't you come and just sit in, and after it's over with, we'll go get a Coke or something, and uh, we'll talk about it. And then he'd say, hey, I'm going to go visiting uh, hospitals today. I'd like you to go with me. And he, he would take me, and he'd talk to me the whole time, just real gentle, not bossy, just be telling me, sit down. Now, when you go into the here, you know, She's going to be a little bit upset, so let's just, you know, and he would just talk to me and, and show me how to minister. And within two years, I learned how to be a pastor by watching Denzel Dukes. Amen. He let me preach. He let me teach Sunday school and just let me do things. And I thought, where, you know, the guy was a wonderful mentor. And I'm sitting there saying, Lord, thank you. Thank you. So when I go to my first church, I know how to baptize people. I know how to do funerals. I know how to do weddings. I know how to do hospital visits. I know how to counsel people because Denzel Dukes taught me. Now, you don't have to be in the ministry and you don't have to be young to have a mentor. How many of you know that all of us at best are preschoolers when it comes to spiritual maturity? Anybody, right? There's nobody in here that is some PhD in spiritual maturity. We're all just in kindergarten. But there's always somebody a little bit farther down the road than you that you could attach to and it would make you a better person. It's great to read your Bible. It's great to pray. It's great to go to men's conferences. But you know what? Men are loners. We are not like our wives. We don't really have intimate relationships. We don't really have strong friends that we can build life with. We just don't. And God wants you to have a mentor. So think about that. We're going to talk about Jehoshaphat. He says, is that the guy that was always jumping? He never jumped, all right? I don't know where that came from. I don't know. I don't even want to know where that came from, all right? I couldn't care less. But he was one of the good kings in Judah. He lived in the 9th century B.C., and he loved the Lord. Now, he messed up. You know, the reason I know the Bible is inspired by God is God shows the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, in most books... If somebody's trying to really put somebody up, they don't tell anything about about the bad in them, all right? But the Bible's not like that. The Bible is a a good, literal presentation of your life. It's going to be kind of like the judgment, okay? (laughs) It's all going to be there, the good, bad, and the ugly. But aren't you glad that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin? Amen. So, this guy loved the Lord. He reigned for 41 years. He loved the people of the Lord. God used him. He wasn't perfect, but he was 
Jehoshaphat was mentored by his father. And you can call it Asa, Asa, or as the Hebrews would say, Asa. I'll probably go with one of all three at any time, all right? But that's, it's A-S-A. And I just want us to look at that today and think about the blessing of a godly mentor. Now let's go back just a second. I want to give you just a little bit of a panoramic uh, context here of the kings of Israel. The first one was Saul. Does anybody remember King Saul, the big guy? Yeah, Saul started off very good, loved the Lord, came in there, defeated the Philistines, but then straight away from the Lord, don't have time to go into all that, God took the Holy Spirit from him. He removed, and do you remember when David said in Psalm 51, Lord, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Do you remember that? He had seen that in Saul's life, and he said, man, I don't want that. Saul went nuts. A, a, a demon started harassing him when God took his spirit away from him. And, and David said, I don't want any of that. So Saul was the first king, and, uh, and then came David. David loved the Lord, man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel 13 says that. But we all know that he messed up, didn't he? Uh, you know, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Should have been out fighting. He was on a rooftop looking and saw a naked woman out there bathing and had an affair with her, got her pregnant, had her husband killed. I mean, that's about as bad as you get. That's adultery and murder, all right? So that's bad. But yet, the Bible says he did not give in to idolatry and that ultimately, even though he was a bad father, I mean, he spoiled his kids rotten. He had really bad kids. And then he even got proud, so proud that he numbered the people, had Joab number the people, and God killed 70,000 of them to say, you want to keep numbering? I'll just keep knocking them away if you want to keep numbering them, all right? I want to say this to you. I tell our guys all the time, I know we got to look at numbers, but we better not live for numbers because numbers scare me. Numbers scare me. Because you can get real proud real quick, and anytime pride walks in, God walks out. And I don't want that, do you? Let's, let's look at numbers, but don't, you can glance at them, but don't gaze at them, all right? And don't worship them. There's really nothing to them anyway. David sinned, but he never gave in to the pagan idols like his son Solomon, his grandson Rehoboam, and his great son, grandson Abijah. So King Solomon is next. He was brilliant, he was articulate. He was scholarly. He started well. He built great buildings. He ruled over a vast empire, but he ended very poorly because he became immoral and idolatrous. He became immoral. He had 700 wives. Now, they call him the wisest person besides Jesus. Come on now, 700 wives? That's wise. Plus, and then he adds on 300 concubines, and most all of them didn't love God. That's not good, is it? That's just not good. So, here you got a man that's so brilliant, he turned his heart, and, and the women turned his heart away from the Lord. And he became the first one, we'll read about in a minute, to start worshiping the gods of the Canaanites. David didn't. Saul didn't even do that, as wicked as Saul was. And so, God took it all away from him, gave it to Rehoboam, Rehoboam his son. Israel split under the leadership of Rehoboam in two nations became Israel in the north, ten, nation, ten uh, tribes in the north, two in the south, Judah, and that was uh, Judah and, and the tribe of Benjamin. And like Solomon, his father, he worshiped Canaanite gods. And then his son, Abijah, or Abijam, two different pronunciations, he reigned only three years. He wasn't a good king. He also worshiped Canaanite gods. The Bible says in 1 Kings 15, verse 3 there, he walked in all the sins of his father, talking about Rehoboam, which he had committed before him, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God like the heart of his father David. Now, so you've got Saul that messed up, David that had a heart for God, messed up, neither one of them committed idolatry, but three in a row, bam, 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 you've got guys, you got Solomon, you got Rehoboam and Abijah, they all commit spiritual adultery, which is idolatry. And then you got a guy come up named Asa. Asa reigned three years with his dad, or no, no, he, he would reign three years later on with his son, rather, uh, Jehoshaphat, and he would teach him and mentor him. But Asa was the first reformer, if you will. 
I'm not talking about Reformed theology. I'm talking about he was the first Reformer. He was the first one to pray for God to send a revival. And God did. And he did not commit idolatry. So, he's a good mentor. And uh, let's look at and see some of the things he did. First of all, a godly mentor. But, and here's the, here's the deal. Look at me. Somebody needs you to pour into their lives. Somebody. You say, oh, not me, Brother Steve. I, I'm just, I, you know, come on, man. Yes, you can. Man up. Yes, you can. You can do this. You need to have somebody pour in your life. You need a Paul, but you need a Timothy. You need somebody to pour into, and every one of you can do it. You can. You can you, the, you, what God has entrusted to you, He hasn't just given it for you. He's given it for you to give away. Listen, everything God has given you has to be held like this, even spiritual maturity. You've got to give it away. You've got to be thinking about the next generation. Quit complaining about the current generation and start discipling and mentoring them. Stop it. They need help. They need a Denzel Dukes. <laughs> they need somebody. They need an Asa to come along and to mentor them. And listen, there are some guys out there that would listen to you if you would just take them in. It doesn't have to be real formal. Just take them to lunch. Take them to supper. Take them whatever. and Just have some time with them and spend some time. Pray with them and just spend some time with them. Read the Bible with them. Okay, let me get back in my sermon. <laughs> Refrains from sexual immorality. Look at verse 10. In chapter 15, he reigned 41 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Absalom. Actually, that's Absalom, the son of David, and she was actually his granddaughter. Asa did what was right in the sight of the Lord like his, David his father. That means he did not participate in pagan idolatry. Verse 12, he also put away the male cult prostitutes from the land. You say, what in the world is that? homosexual prostitutes. That's what that is. Uh, King James says he took away the sodomites. Sodomites, somebody guilty of sodomy, homosexuality. And in this place, it's male cult prostitutes. And in Deuteronomy 23, 18, I want you to see this text. Look on the screen. God says, you shall not bring the hire of a harlot or the wages of a what? A dog into the house of the Lord your God for any votive offering, for both of these are a what? Say it out loud. Abomination. Abomination to the Lord your God. The female cult prostitutes were called harlots. The male cult prostitutes were called dogs. Dogs. Paul would pick up that same imagery in one of his uh, epistles, and he would call some theologians who were, they were just heretics, he called them dogs. Now why a dog. Why? Because dogs will have sex with anybody at any time. Dogs are nasty. Dogs are immoral, we would say. If they were people, they'd be moral. So the Canaanite male prostitutes were like dogs. They'd have sex with anybody, any way, any time. You say, why are you telling us this? Because our society is going more and more that way. More and more that way. And so Asa, a godly man, banished them from the land. Can you even imagine a political leader opposing a male homosexual prostitute today? Can you even imagine what, what the media would do to somebody if they called a male homosexual prostitute a dog? Can you even fathom what? Oh, there would be an outrage, would there not? Do you see what's happening to our nation? And do you understand why it's always fitting to study the people? Listen, there's nothing new under the sun. That's what Solomon said. Don and I vacationed in Banff, Canada this summer. Beautiful place. We just talked to somebody about that that did their honeymoon there. When we arrived, we, we picked up a, just a local paper, and there's this drag queen on the That's a guy dressed up like a man on the front. I've never seen such paint and stuff on it. It was, it was the weirdest looking. I don't know how anybody could think that that was attractive. It was, it was just bizarre. It was beyond bizarre. And he was teaching 
little children. And the mothers were excited about this drag queen teaching. It has a picture there in the park. Guys, do you understand that that is perversion? Do you understand that that is wrong? That's what he's banishing here, okay? That's the kind of thing Asa was against. I praise God that God can deliver anybody from any sexual sin. And if you want a demonic stronghold, be sexually immoral. Fornication, which is cohabitation. If you're cohabitating, the Bible says you're committing fornication and it is sin and you need to stop it. Amen, Amen belongs there. Amen. What's wrong with you guys? Amen. Amen belongs there. You need to get out. You need to, and by the way, you're the one that got the lady in that position. You need to pay for her rent too because you got her in that place. Okay? You need to get out and either get married or break it off. Amen. Thank you. Praise God. Bring that man to the front table. All right. <laughs> Fornication, adultery, homosexuality, lesbianism, bisexuality, transgenderism, bestiality, pornography. On and on I could go. It's all a one-way ticket to have a demonic stronghold in your life. It opens the door up to the devil. You can't be sexually immoral and walk with God. You can't have it both ways. And so he banishes this stuff. And a godly mentor always does it. But I want to say this to you. God can save and deliver anybody from any kind of sexual immorality. Amen. <laughs> Listen to this. I love this. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not be, don't be deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were, everybody say were, were. Everybody, such were some of you, but you've been washed, hallelujah. You've been sanctified, hallelujah. You've been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of the living God. You can be pulled out of that stuff. You don't have to live in that stuff. You don't have to be an addict to pornography. You don't have to have those thoughts. You can take your thoughts captive and say, in the name of Jesus, I will not walk in immorality. Amen. Guys, you've got to get to where you, you just, you're ready to be set free. And Jesus, whom the Son sets free, will be free indeed. Get those chains off you. And, and just remember, a, a, a mentor, godly mentor, you've got to refrain from sexual immor immorality. You can't mentor somebody else and have that junk in your life. You can't do it. You've got to get rid of that stuff and then mentor somebody else. Number two, a godly mentor. I didn't know. I, I, I don't usually get this excited this early in the morning. All right. So <laughs> he refrains from spiritual idolatry. Now, sexual immor immorality is with a person. Spiritual idolatry is spiritual adultery. Okay? Sexual immorality is cheating on your wife. Spiritual idolatry is cheating on God. And usually they go together. Not always, but usually. Look at verse 12. And he removed all the idols which, were his, fa which his fathers had made. If you go back to the kings before, listen to what the, the Bible says about Solomon. In, turn back just a second to 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 4. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods. His heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, after Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites, Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not follow the Lord fully as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech. That's where you burn the babies right there. To Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Thus all also he did for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. 
And that would include child sacrifice. Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. Solomon was sexually immoral and he was spiritually idolatrous. And again, they go together. A lot of times when somebody is idolatrous, they're immoral. And if they're immoral, they're idolatrous. They get caught up into weird sexual sins because they're in, involved in idolatry. You let somebody get involved in Wiccanism and almost inevitably, not always, but almost inevitably, they get into lesbianism. Now, every lesbian is not a Wiccan, but almost every Wiccan is a lesbian. It's unbelievable. Why? Because idolatry and immorality go together. They just go. You want to open up yourself to demonic strongholds, just be sexually immoral. That's all you have to do. And or get involved in another occult, okay? Those things open you up to the devil. He says, well, I'm a Christian. The devil can't bother me. Who are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> he can harass you. He can't possess you, but he can't oppress you, okay? And it's bad. Some of you guys hang around on your little internet stuff and watching stuff. You, you say, I would never, I'm, I'm not bothering anybody. Yes, you are. You're inviting the devil in your house, and he's going upstairs with your kids. The devil's going to harass your kids because you won't control yourself. It's time to get some help. It's time to get free, all right? Amen. It's time to get set free. You don't have to say amen. You can. I don't care. That's fine. <laughs> Verse 13, he also removed Maacah, his mother. That's wow. That's right. Yeah. She was queen mother. It was actually his grandmother because she had been made a horrid image as an Asherah, Asa. Asa cut it down, her hard image, and burned it in the brook Kidron. Kidron is a little stream that runs right by the Garden of Gethsemane. We go there every time we go to Israel. Now you say, well, I praise God, I don't have any problem with that. Hey, look at me. You can be idolatrous. Anything that's more important to you than Jesus is an idol. Amen. Anything more important to you than Jesus is an idol. It can be money, possessions, athletics, houses, cars, trucks, boats, hunting, fishing, and on and on. Athletics, entertainment, celebrities, politicians, it's endless. Anything that's more important to you than Jesus, you've got to refrain from spiritual idolatry. Number three, a godly mentor devotes his heart to the Lord. Not just your mind, but your heart. Look at verse 14. But the high places were not taken away. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly devoted to the Lord all his days. God changed Asa on the inside, and it showed on the outside. That's what Christianity is. God does a number on your heart, does he not? All of a sudden, you love people you used not to love. You, you love the Word of God, and you didn't love the Word of God. You stopped doing things because on the inside, you've been fixed on the inside. You know, if you've got a bad engine, and all you do is polish the car, the car's not going to run any better, right? you got to take care of the engine. And guess what? You can polish the outside all you want to and look a little better all you want to, but if you don't take care of your heart, what does it matter? What does it matter? The Bible says, and I just read this a uh, day or two ago in Proverbs 4, 23, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Everything comes out of the heart. And what is the heart like without Jesus? Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? you got to get saved, and you can't get saved until you give your heart to Jesus, which is exactly what Paul said in these famous words in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your what? Say it out loud. Heart. That God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. Men, who is ruling your heart? What has hold of your heart right now? What really grabs you? What is it that you live for? If it's not Jesus, what is it? Man, Jesus needs to be at the heart of everything you are. You say, I'm not in the ministry. I didn't talk about the ministry. I'm talking about walking with God. You can be a mechanic and walk with God. You can be a doctor and walk with God. You can be a lawyer and walk with God. You can be whatever and walk with God, but you've got to have a heart for God. You've got to seek first the kingdom, Matthew 6, 20, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God wants your heart, the essence of who you're, you are. 
He wants more than a few hours on Sunday. He wants more than a prayer before a meal. He wants you to devote your heart to the Lord. And that's what a mentor has to do. You've got to be right with God. Number four, a godly mentor devotes his possessions to the Lord. Very quickly, look at verse uh, 15. He brought into the house of the Lord the dedicated things of his father and his own dedicated things, silver and gold and utensils. His possessions did not own him. He owned them and he gave them to God. He realized that he had nothing in his hand when he came out of the womb, and he'd have nothing in his hand when he went to the tomb. Amen? He realized that there's, you know, you don't own anything. It's you, you're just a little, you're just a little, you know, person that's taking care of somebody else's stuff. You don't own anything. It, it's, it's all temporary. You're just a, a person that's a steward, a caretaker of all the good gifts of God. And you learn that Jesus was right in Acts 20, verse 35, it's more blessed to give than to receive. You start thinking about what can I give somebody instead of what can I get? And that's when your life has been changed. Last thing is this, a godly mentor seeks to finish well. Asa did not finish well. So we're going to have to learn from a negative example, okay? Look at verse 16. Now there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all their days. And I don't have time to read all of this, but I will just tell you what happened. There had been a time in Asa's life when he had a million Ethiopians come against him, and he had this little dinky army, and he prayed, and God routed, I mean routed the Ethiopians from the land of Cush. But this time he doesn't do that. He takes money. And he goes to Syria and he pays off the king who had been helping the king of Israel. He's in Judah. Israel and Judah were always fighting after they broke up under Rehoboam. And so he gets this guy, Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, and he says, I want you to be on my side. He takes all this money out of the treasury, gives it to him instead of trusting God. And I want to see you to see what happened. Go, the, you don't, just look on the screen. The, the parallel text about this, it doesn't tell us this in 1 Kings 15, but in 2 Chronicles 16, listen to this. At that time, Hanani the seer, that's the prophet, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Aram and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Aram has escaped out of your hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubim an immense army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, He delivered them out into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord, you ever heard this verse? For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that He may strongly support those whose heart is completely His. You have acted foolishly in this. He's talking to Asa now. Indeed, from now on you will surely have wars. And Asa said, you're right, I repent. No. Look what he does. Asa was angry with the seer and put him in prison. He was enraged at him for this. He, 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 he locked up the man of God. Not a good thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. Now the acts of Asa from first to last, behold, they're written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. That's what we're reading in 1 Kings 15. In the thir 39th year of his reign, how many years did he reign? 41. So the last three, here's what's going on. Asa became diseased in his feet. He had severe gout is what he had, okay? And the Bible says, his disease was severe, yet even in his disease he did not seek the Lord but the physician. So Asa slept with his fathers. What does that mean? He died. I won't read the rest of it. You don't mess around with godly things. You just don't. you got to finish well. How many times have you heard a football player say, fourth quarter? Why? Because that's when the game usually, not always, but usually that's when it's won or lost. How many times have you heard somebody runs track and say, I got, a, I got a kick at the end, right? How many times have you heard a baseball game, oh, it's down to the end, end of the ninth inning. And guys, look at me. You can have a great start. Some of you are living for the Lord. Praise God. Finish well. And some of you, some of you have messed up. Aren't you glad God is a forgiving God? Amen. Finish well. 
finish well. I don't care if you're doing good or if you hadn't done good. Get right with God and stay with God and say, you know what? I'm not going to just peter out. I'm not just going to kind of, you know, mosey to the finish line. I want to be stretching, running into the arms of Jesus when I hit the tape. I want to do right. Asa didn't go all the way through. He messed up at the end. God gave, don't tell me God doesn't give diseases. Yes, he does. He gave him gout. Messed his, messed his legs up. Messed his feet up. And even then, he wouldn't repent. And God said, okay, you're out. How many of you know when God says you're out, you're out? Anybody know that? <laughs> yeah, God can take you out. You're not, you're, not, you're not too big for God to take out. God's taking out bigger people than you. We need mentors. We need godly people. And I just pray, I just pray that you will, you will say, Lord, give me a mentor. Give me a Paul. And Lord, then when I grow enough, give me a Timothy that I can pour into. And oh God, let me refrain from sexual immorality. Let me refrain from any sort of spiritual idolatry. Don't let anything be more important to my heart than Jesus Christ. Lord, help me to devote my heart to you. Not just religion, go through the motions, but let my heart be right with you, God. And de- let me devote my possessions to you, Lord. Don't let them possess me. Let me give you my possessions. And then, Lord, oh, please, please, Lord, I know that I'm going to be remembered for how I finish, so help me to finish strong. May God bless you with a Denzel Dukes. May God bless you with a mentor. And may you be a mentor godly mentor to somebody else. Amen? Amen. 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 Father, we love you. Bless these sweet men. Thank you for them. Have your hand upon them. And thank you for them being here today. In Jesus' name, amen.